May the Lord bless you. Welcome back to the True Tunes Podcast. I'm your host, John J. Thompson, and on this episode, you will hear the conclusion of my conversation with multi-instrumentalist, songwriter, producer, and raconteur in the first degree, Mr. Phil Madeira. If you have not heard part one of this conversation, I would encourage you to go check that out first and then come back and rejoin this conclusion. But honestly, I'm just glad you're here. You can listen in whatever order you like. Last time we heard Phil reflect on his earliest days as a member of a couple of different bands in the Jesus music scene of the 1970s, and then we talked about the shift he made in the late 80s to play more with mainstream artists like Buddy Miller and Emmylou Harris. On this episode, we'll hear more about Phil's recent work as a solo artist and songwriter, including how some pretty significant loss and pain helped shape him as an artist. We're also going to crank up the jukebox and take a listen to a trilogy of recent Phil Madeira solo albums that provide a rich and rewarding portrait of this fascinating artist. When we broke away from our conversation, Phil had just told us about his transition away from working exclusively on music being produced for Christian audiences as he oriented himself both as an instrumentalist in the service of other artists and as a songwriter and artist in his own right, more toward the mainstream Americana scene, which interestingly included him writing writing and producing two collections of specifically sacred songs called Mercy Land, Hymns for the Rest of Us, that he recorded with an incredible list of well-known Americana artists like the Carolina Chocolate Drops, the Civil Wars, Amy Stroop, Matt Kearney, North Mississippi All-Stars, Dan Tominski, the Wood Brothers, Will Kimbrough, and others. This has long been one of the most interesting aspects of Madeira's work to me personally, his ability to swim artistically in gospel waters in a way that is approachable and appreciated by people who share his theological perspectives and who don't. So let's go back to Madeira's living room and rejoin this conversation, already in progress, about that transition and the way his horizons have expanded. I got something to say Might cause you pain If I get you talking to that boy again I'm gonna let you down And leave you playing Because I told you before Oh, you came to that And so when you talk about the getting out of that, you're basically... Um, you're eschewing the parameters or the limitations that say this music is for a particular audience without eschewing the desire to still talk about spiritual things and spiritual ideas and yeah i mean it's really i mean it's funny to me that on the new record you're you're hearing and i I think i understand what you're saying i know i know there's stuff in there because there's stuff in me But honestly, John, it's kind of like I feel like I've, you know, if if that stuff comes through, well, that's great. But it's definitely not me. Oh, trying to make sure. Oh, right. It's not like you got to check a box and make sure that there's a certain amount. Look, I've made I've made those records. Even, you know, even even the um, the Mercyland stuff. You know, Mercyland I made for a reason, and that was to say, no, 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 no. This, you know, this God is all embracing. This God is not mad that Obama is president or whatever. That's what you know. That's when I started right. making those records when was, when he was running for president. I am not interested in performing theologically for anybody. I, I'm not. I I have no concern that somebody might be worried about my soul I do not care I'm not worried about your soul do I do I want to talk about Jesus if it can be done constructively like I I I do believe but I I look back at my own life and I've come to this place for this reason I see I mean my parents were loving they loved God and I'm so grateful for them. 
But I look back at what was then the church and what this same thing is now, and I realize, okay, this this chasm between Christians, and I'm sorry, I, I, I'm sorry to talk about politics, but I think it's sort of the elephant in the room when you talk about faith or church or any of that stuff. And I think for all these years that I thought I was viewing the same Jesus as somebody like Franklin Graham was viewing. Now, I am dead and wrong. There is absolutely no way that he and I are seeing the same Jesus. So I look at the base of Christianity in America, which is largely that world, uh, at least the evangelical world, and I think to myself, oh my gosh, this is about indoctrination. We were all indoctrinated the same way and buying into doctrines, not spirit. And now I'm looking at you, John, and I'm saying, hey, buddy, so, because I'm pretty sure you and I see the same Jesus. I'm like, (laughs) hey, who is this Jesus that the majority of these people have been seeing? Because it's all about protecting the real estate it's all about protecting the ideology it's like and now i'm at that point i love christ so much and i love the story so much that i don't worry i kind of do wish there were a hell because there's a donald trump (laughs) um but i kind of don't right i don't think that way anymore i'm not worried about what happens Had some real long hair, a robe and some sandals. That'd be what I'd wear. I'd be the guy at the party, turning water to wine. Me and my disciples would have a real good time. I'd lay my life down for you. I'd show you who's the boss I'd forgive you and adore you While I was hanging on your cross If I was Jesus It does seem to me to be, um, I keep thinking that politics and dogma are probably in the same at the same level of human discourse and it's it's not that it's an unimportant level because it's how things get done it's it's a practical level but it's somewhere down here you know whereas values and principles and ethics and conceptual stuff is somewhere much higher and so when you're saying that the Jesus that we know that to me it seems that gospel music and art in general, when it's functioning, the stuff that moves me is functioning up here. Mm-hmm. And that's why we can find this common lexicon of things that's moving us on a level up here. And then it can seep down into how it forms our politics and our dogma, how we practice, how we quote unquote do church, how we live in our communities and stuff. But when we get that backwards and we say that our politics is going to inform our dogma or our politics is going to inform our faith, and we've just got everything upside down. I just really appreciate your intentionality and your willingness to to go through that gauntlet for those years and come out as such a valuable asset for people. Mm-hmm. Um, it also seems that you, um, it seems that Phil Madeira in the last 10 years is a different person than Phil Madeira in the late eighties and early nineties. And a couple of the characteristics that I have heard others say, and I've heard you say about yourself, always a really funny guy, but maybe the bitterness and the, the, um, 
you weren't as ha- you weren't happy a lot of the time. You, you told me you, know, you were. Uh, you told me at one point in the last ten years or so that that you were happier than you had ever been. Mm. How how have some of these things? Do you do you feel when you look back at yourself like you've talked about the emerging Phil? Uh, when you look back at yourself or portraits of yourself creatively or personally, um, how do you feel these changes that you've made have? Uh, affected your peace of mind. There's a great song on the new record um, that I feel like kind of touches on this a little bit. Peace of mind, you know, that you're just, do you feel like you're oh, getting I've there? I made my peace. I made my peace, yeah. yeah. Do you feel like you're getting there? Do you feel uh, like you're sleeping better at night when your head hits the pillow you know, with who you are? The thing is, is what I, what I recognize, life is too short to not, you know, I'll, I'll answer any question. You know, so I, I'm just not. I am very happy. This record of which you're speaking, Hornet's Nest, mm, most of that record. I mean, the, the 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 first song of the record I wrote in 1988. That and another song I wrote about. Uh, my estranged relationship with my brother you know now I don't in fact one of uh, my relatives when they found out I was put in a song on there called Mom Always Liked You Best I heard from someone saying you know are you really ready to burn down the bridge because if you are go ahead and put the record out and I'm like well number one you don't understand (laughs) I mean this is mastered it's too late to have this conversation but I wouldn't ask you to quit your job if it meant burning. A, you know, I mean, it's just kind of a, a lot to ask. But I, but I said, what bridge? What bridge are you talking about? You know, because in that case, man, I kept going back. I kept going back. I said, every, you know, every time there was an opportunity for reconciliation, yes. And finally just reached that point of just saying, old habits die hard, it's not going to happen, and I'm okay with, you know, now I didn't make a decision not to speak, but I'm okay with that. And I, I don't mean to get too into the weeds of life. You got a lot of glitter, there ain't no gold. Charming on the surface, but you got no soul. You were always something of a hornet's nest. Cause mama always liked you best. You're a big bad bully, smooth as they come. Trying to keep the world flat under your thumb. And you were always something of a tangled mess. Cause mama always liked you best. Got no intention of Pop in your bubble, but daddy always said you a stone trouble. Said from a young age you were spoiled rotten. Couldn't stand to see nobody else in high cotton. So two songs about that estrangement. One song about nobody's estrangement, just a made-up tune that's a duet with Cindy Morgan. But then, and then, um, so one song called, uh, what's uh, 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 welcome to World War Three. What's the, yeah. what's I can't even think of the actual title, but anyway, um, that song was just written. I heard somebody talking about their marriage falling apart and saying it's about to be World War Three, and I just <laughs> did yeah. that thing where you yeah. <laughs> imagine you're writing that on a little pad, you know. Yeah. Yeah. We like two countries cross the borderline. There's your side of the bed. Then there's mine Fragile as an egg Sitting on a pile of cake We, we might, might see World War Three in our, our lifetime It's gonna come, come down to us like Paris Spring Marching to war there won't up to now I wasn't 
stand for me, honey. Welcome to World War Three. And then the other seven songs are written about the loss of my partner of many years, basically a decade. And when she was dying of cancer, she pushed me, you know, she was, she, she was pushing me away and she had created a narrative, which I'm amazed I survived the narrative. And the narrative was that I had distanced myself from her because of her cancer, which is like, you do not want that narrative out there, but even if it were true. Unfortunately, it wasn't true. And so during the season of her really descending into hospice and not a lot of time left and real suffering, um, I was allowed to see her once and it was bittersweet and there's a song about it on the, on this record called Last Time We Said Hello Was Goodbye, where we had that moment, you know, I had gone to her and said, look, we have messed this thing up, but you're still here. I'm still here. We can go out strong. And um, that didn't happen because she had so married herself to this narrative Almost, almost from the point she had found out she had cancer, I sensed a story taking shape. And I asked her best friend, am I right in perceiving that something's up? And she said, yeah, you are. And so it took about six months for me to finally just say, hey, let's redefine this thing. And that turned into, he broke up with me because I have cancer. So I had a whole, I had the community that she and I shared in common, which were mostly her friends, all had really bought into this idea. So the whole time she's dying, I have no recourse. I'm just being beat up. So there's, you know, so these, these are harsh songs on here. And um, weirdly, it was like one of the most beautiful times of my life. Because, I mean, I remember calling Ben Pearson just weeping. I'm in my parking lot at my old apartment building. I'm having a cig. And uh, I'm calling Ben. And I'm just like bawling like a baby. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and, and I just said, man, I want to I, I wanna go see her. I want to, you know, I... Because all, you know, when someone is going, when someone's dying, it doesn't matter how badly the thing wasn't working. You want wholeness. You want wellness for the, for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so Ben was like, well, you got, you know, all I can tell you is you're, you're not going to know until you just go knock on that door, which I did. And I was turned away. It was like everything just got turned upside down. Now just be on a veil is a Will McCoy Sometimes the tail needs a whipping boy Babylon Babylon Don't want the weight of the world is a shoulder you can lay it on They're all about compassion and forgiveness till they kick your ass in and cancel Christmas Babylon So these songs were the only way I knew how to respond because I was not going to call you, John, and say, hey, they're being mean to me. Right. I was not going to call someone and say, but, 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 but no, this isn't how it was. And in and, and, and some ways, I feel like I'm doing that now, which is not what I want to do. Those songs are a record of what was going on that I had no control of. So I'd, I'd go hike at Radnor Lake and I'd be on the top of Ganyar Ridge, which as you know, is the, you know, that's the longest climb in the park. And I would be praying the whole time. I'd be cursing, praying, imagining, maybe writing. Mm -hmm. 
and um so there you know there's song you know one day i was up there and i realized the hospice physician was one of my songwriting students john Mulder, fantastic individual and so he was part of my mercy land songwriter workshop thing she requests him as hospice physician so one day he calls me he goes well i figured out what your role in her departure is mm. your role is the scapegoat right i'm like oh <laughs> Yeah, like a fun thanks. Role. <laughs> right. That's a fun role to play. I go, oh, and he goes, oh, well, he says, now listen, this is very common. I mean, his whole work is end of life care, you know, because it's very common. He said, a lot of times people don't know what to do with death. He says, especially if they're if they're not theistic, you know, if you're theistic, you're, you're, you have somewhere to put the question, why, if. If you're not theistic, the place you might put it is, who do you want to be mad at? And so un he said, unfortunately, she's created a setting for you to for you to be the the uh, recipient of a lot of wrath. And so and so one of the things he said was that her he he had said to her kids, listen, this guy's been in your life. So this is all, she's still alive while this is happening, you know. And he, and he goes, this this guy's been in your life. You need to, you know, he needs to be in the front row of the funeral. I mean, he's been with your mom for, you know, more than you have in the last decade. And how do you feel about him right now? And the son said, I have nothing but righteous indignation for him. So there's a line in that, one of those songs where, you know, your righteous indignation ain't on the level. But you're fine, you know. Uh, she would always say, if she, when she wasn't fine, she would be like, "I'm fine." <laughs> <laughs> and so there is just like, I actually wrote this record before I wrote my open heart record, and I was too afraid to record it. So I recorded open heart, which were love songs. It was me, you know. It was kind of like this. I guess sort of like an affair I'd had after after that was all over. I was involved with someone. I knew it wasn't going to go anywhere, but it was a it was a place to put my grief or lay it aside. And what is so funny about the open heart record is everyone receives that record as something I didn't even see. The opening line of that record is, you're going to grieve it for a long, long time. Your open heart was a scene of the crime. You keep asking the question, why, why, why? Baby, your guess is as good as mine. How do you know how to let go? I mean, I'm writing this stuff not even knowing. And it took the 26-year-old uh, head of the little record company that helped me put that record out. She was the one that said to me, hey, Philip, uh... You know you wrote this record about your your own heart, right? I didn't even know it. We're going to step away from Phil's living room for just a few minutes here and crank up the old jukebox. As you can see, she's been festooned with folk art, beads, and a couple of candles, and it smells great in here. I found some Mardi Gras coins that I'm going to drop in, and let's see what happens. As you've heard, Phil Madeira has made overtures as a solo artist several times over the years. Each of those projects has had its strengths, often presenting his songs in the best light possible. It's no wonder so many have been covered by other artists. But Madeira has released a string of four projects over the last three years that really deserve some careful attention. One of them, Crickets, is an instrumental jazz record that you've heard us use several songs from on the podcast in the last year. The others, however, 
providence, open heart, and hornet's nest function as a sort of cohesive and profoundly satisfying trilogy that display not only Madeira's exceptional songcraft and instrumental prowess, but a rewarding and rare look into the heart and soul of a master craftsman. trilogy opens with Providence, a collection of songs that reflect on Madeira's Rhode Island roots, but can't avoid an artful entendre regarding the hand that seems to have imbued the artist's dreams and ordained his steps for 50 years now. After 30 years focused on lap steel and other stringed instruments, Madeira's return to the piano unleashes a level of compositional complexity and unself-conscious sass that recalls Randy Newman, Lyle Lovett, or a sublimely chilled out Dr. John. There's salt water and iced coffee running through my veins. Though I stretch my words out Southern style Some things never change But I still get excited When I'm in Rhode Island Driving east into the dawn Find myself in Providence. I know I'm your native son. I raised my daughters with the muddy waters and magnolias find their roots. Where a rose at a thorn. Bill Monroe I'll somehow in cahoots And I whittled down my edges and tamed my excesses Near the shadow of the Parthenon When I find myself in Providence I'm your native son. Every song on Providence, in one way or another, references the central idea of finding or rediscovering identity and inspiration in his New England roots. That he was drawn away from his home state by the hand of Providence is undeniable as well. But time and distance, read maturity, allows him to recall the blessings of his roots while not forgetting why he moved on. With humor, compassion, skill, and style, Phil Madeira set this project apart from the rest of his work in a big way.
Madeira's newly re-emboldened willingness to let his jazz flag fly, which was initially unleashed by the release of Providence, seems to have been taken up a notch with the instrumental Crickets project. Then, one year later, less for his Kickstarter backers, he released Open Heart, a collection of what he slyly called love songs. The album's opening track, Requiem for a Dream, dripping with both bluesy soul and hard-won compassion, opens the conversation in a particularly adult way. Yeah, this is going to be about love, but not the butterfly kind of love you felt when you went to a school dance, or even the kind of heartache you felt after your first breakup. This song tapped into something you only get to once you've logged some serious miles. You're gonna grieve it for a long, long time Your open heart was the scene of the crime You keep asking the question, why, why, why Baby, your guess is as good as mine How do you know? How to let go Don't get me wrong though, it's not a wall-to-wall downer. There are some wonderfully self-deprecating romps like The Likes of Me and the determined soul tune Shelter You, while A Problem Like You has a playful spirit in the lyric and a groove recalling the work of New Orleans native Harry Connick Jr. The album closes with the slow burner, Monk, a classic old-school torch song that leans heavily into literal jazz references, from Thelonious to Nina Simone, and spares no expense with its lavish sound. Songwriters, notice the way Madeira zooms from the wide-angle view of the famous jazz names to the hyper-intimate references to the woman he is singing to. It's this kind of dexterity that sets him apart and makes this an album that should have a much wider audience than it has enjoyed thus far. Let's put on some monk Let's chase down some trains You know I love a good singer Till the words get in the way I'll open the wine You grease up the pain Now let's saute some something And slow dance to the man The trilogy concludes with this year's complex and dynamic Hornet's Nest, from which you've already heard some key tracks and we'll hear a few more in just a bit when we get back to my conversation with Phil. Born of pain and including songs that come from as far back as the late 80s, Madeira stays locked in on his jazz influences, tastefully loaded with horns and anchored by the double threat of his sophisticated piano-based compositions and his razor-sharp lyrical precision. 
Throughout this deeply satisfying album, Madeira identifies the nexus of relational tension, and then, instead of being diplomatic, he dives straight in. This album, as with Open Heart, is produced flawlessly in that old-fashioned, real musicians playing actual instruments way. You forget how much you miss the gorgeous sound of air moving around drums, an upright bass, a horn section, and piano strings, until you hear them again like this. It's just sublime. I watched it happen I saw you sink like a stone I was addicted to hope So I threw you a rope when you dove Between phone calls, prayers and teardrops Chapter and verse As the hairline cracked in a family tree Just grew worse I wish I were a guardian angel I'm simply a man And I wish I were a guiding light But I'm a flesh in the pain Hornet's Nest, Open Heart, Providence, and the instrumental LP Crickets are all vinyl-worthy collections that deserve to be savored. Phil Madeira is crafting music at a very high level here, musically, lyrically, and emotionally. And from the sounds of it, he's not stopping anytime soon. Another collection is coming, as are two sets from the Red Dirt Boys. Make sure to follow him online so you don't miss your chance to back them when the time comes. Okay, now back to my conversation with the man himself. So what's your response to that record? I mean, it's like, I don't even know how people feel about it. Well, what's interesting to me is the, I thought the same thing about open heart. To me, it felt like open heart and there's a missing word, which is surgery. (laughs) Like, like, like like here I am, I'm ripping it open and and then I'm going to start to do the work. Um, It disguises itself as romantic, but it's the romance of an adult that's going, yeah, this this mere affection Valentine's Day stuff is not going to get you yeah. anywhere. This is adult stuff. When you ain't got love, you got cigarettes. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of stuff. <laughs> but the but the hornet's nest one, I think I was expecting something more angry and less resolved, less centered, and the the thing that the, the moments that really to me help it transcend well for one thing the way it ends which i don't want to do a spoiler but no, spoil what too. turns the whole thing into a gospel record for me is the the final send-off i ain't gonna study war no more like yeah. like i'm gonna go into the hornet's nest and i'm gonna get stung mm. but in the end i'm gonna learn something from this and to end it with a gospel song to end it with elements of a gospel song at least and and a gospel song that's really tied to the civil rights movement a gospel song that's that's essentially taking scripture and applying it to beating swords into plowshares like if you want to talk about what is redemption that is redemption that is taking something meant for evil and turning it into something that's going to actually produce crops you know, and, it's so interesting you i mean i'm I mean, I, I, you're right about that ending. The very last song I wrote for that project, I wrote after I had recorded the record, and I, I wrote um, last time we said hello because I thought, man, I, I need something. I need something that really says, hey, I loved this person, mm-hmm. you know. Last time we said hello Did either of us know It was goodbye The thing 
things I wish I'd said Still swirling in my head Too late to try There's something to be treasured I'll look back and I'll take pleasure But it's gonna take a while So I keep my lights down low Cause last time we said hello Was goodbye Last time we said hello We told each other so I love you We each apologized Tears flowing from our eyes Cause it was true On from my devotion, but it's gonna take a while. And baby, did you know? Last time we said hello was goodbye. So I wrote that after you know we had recorded the record. We had recorded, we recorded Hornet's Nest, Chris and Brian and me, uh, Chris Donahue, Brian Owings and me. We recorded it as Open Heart was being mixed. I had an opportunity to go to Blackbird Studio and do it, and I did. And my 10th song was a song I'd already recorded called um, Old Song, which is one of my favorite songs, also written with Jimmy Lee Sloves. Because I didn't have a 10th song, but I really thought, you know, I need something. So I wrote that, and I've made my piece slash Down by the Riverside. You know, I had written I've Made My Peace. I had these lyrics. I didn't have music. I, I had different music. And then I realized, no, this need to be... And you can hear Leon Russell's influence on yeah. my playing on that song. I thought, you know, this needs to be just gospel... And before, when we rehearsed, it was a different beat. And then we got in the studio and I was like, Brian, you know, what if you did your second line thing? Because Brian Owings, he, he does New Orleans like nobody. He's fantastic. So it had, it had an even more joyous feel. And then, you know, I don't know how it came to me to do Down by the Riverside. Well, I ain't gonna I knew I needed to say, you know, I've got a song about a, a, a relationship with a sibling that will never be resolved. I know that. I'm, I'm quite sure that we've gone too far. Even my recording those songs is almost like, a, I hate to say it, it's like a stake in the ground. Me make reporting that this sucks mm -hmm. uh, and even poking fun at it because I find things you know you know something had happened where you know something outrageous had happened and unfortunately if you do something outrageous with me i might not reply to you in fact i will reply in an email as i did in this one 
Oh, I'm, gee, I'm so sorry to have upset you over you know, something really ridiculous. I had sent my sibling, a, he, I had sent his stepdaughter a wedding gift. And man, it was like all hell broke loose. And so I said, oh, I'm very sorry. But then I go home and I write, Mom, I always liked you best. And now I'm going to have fun with it. And I'm going to have a line like, you were always something of an acid test. You know? <laughs> That's I mean, a funny line. <laughs> I mean, it's like, don't mess with don't mess with a songwriter, at least this one. Right. Because that's how I work it out. Disgraced, lost face, no matter your racket. You were tailor-made for a straight jacket. And you were always something of an acid test. Because mom always liked you best. But in that record, yes, I've put a stake in the ground saying, yep, or a stake in the heart of something with right. my sibling and the Meryl stuff, you know, my former partner. It's like, yes, I've revealed that we've just gone through hell. But on those hikes at Radnor Lake, when I'm sorting through what does it mean to be a scapegoat, and I'm at the top of the Ganyu Ridge, and I hear myself say, because, you know, I mean, it's not like I think I'm some great example of, of anything, honestly, of certainly of anything good. But on the top of that hill, in the worst time in my life, in the most painful time of my life, I'm hearing myself say, you know what? I wonder if there's a need, like a psychological need that these children have to have a scapegoat. And if that's if that's how it is, I'm hearing me, mm -hmm. a guy who's just as happy to say, off you, or screw you if you need to edit it. Anyway, I'm hearing that guy say, hey, if this will help them, I'll be a scapegoat. I'll take that job. So I've never answered any of my accusers. I've had people say terrible things. About, and I've never, I've been content. I'm fine to have that story out there. But who I became and whom I'm becoming, who, whom I, be, you know, I'm grateful that I just went through hell. Uh, and I had to end the record that way. But one, there's one lyric change in Damn by the Riverside that you yeah. have never heard before. I'm going to scatter your ashes. Yes, that's the one I, yeah. And because, and there was a part of me that was like. I couldn't tell if that was a positive oh, tribute or if it was uh, off the cuff dismissive and i thought because clearly the first song was not a romantic partner it was a sibling but other ones were i liked the universality of the way these songs transcended whatever the specificity was about mm -hmm. those relationships I love so that you scattering wonder. the ashes can mean both it can mean the way we scatter ashes of someone according to their wishes dad wanted his ashes scattered in the ocean whatever or i'm just gonna kick the dust off my shoes yeah. of this thing. And I just, I loved that because, because again, that leads to the soil becoming ready for whatever grows next. I, you know, and I think, I, I love that you're hearing it, hearing it both ways, you know, and there's a side of me that's kind of like, I'm content to have it both ways because I, I know myself well enough to know that me saying that truthfully is me saying hey you know i am done with this thing right i don't look back longingly and i i you know i i hear from from off kilter all the way up i hear in my material a man who just actually just wants to have an amazing relationship with someone i hear that mm -hmm. you know now i think I think I'm in that at this moment. Uh, in fact, I could, I dare say I know I am, but so every hardship and heartache to me, I am grateful for. And, and, and I think if you think I'm different than I was, you know, 20 years ago or something like that, at some point I learned to say thank you. And 
that to me, is, you know, is the best advice I can give somebody. You know, what should I do? Give thanks. You know, I'm in a horrible situation. Give thanks. It, it, you know, it may be your making. This thing that you feel undone by is probably the thing that's going to make you. And, um, but yeah, the re that record is, I'll probably never do anything like it again. But then again, I mean, it sounds amazing. Like the tone, it sounds old school recording studio. Great. It doesn't sound like home recording pro yeah. tools in the, in it's the live, you know, it's live stuff. with a really good piano and a good band. Right. And, I, I mean, I think of Chris and Brian like they're they're a safety net. As long as those guys are holding down the fort, I can take some crazy solo. It might it might sound like really intelligent or something. And I'm I'm just taking chances. I have no idea. You know, I'm not sounds sure. Sounds familiar. Sounds like what you've been doing. And then yeah. you're throwing in some harmonica. You're throwing in some horns and some things tastefully here and there that that add some really cool color that mm. are like oh what. I rewind it. Is that a harmonica in there? Was that Buddy or who, who's playing a harmonica? Oh, that's at Pat, Pat Bergerson played guitar on most of the um, Hornet's Nest record, and he 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 might be a, a. I mean, he's an unbelievable guitar player, but he might even be a better harmonica player. And he so he had brought that. I wasn't hearing any harmonica. I don't tend to want to hear harmonica on a whole lot of stuff, unless it is just raw blues. I or Toot Stillman or something. But so Pat brought out his harmonica and I, just, I was kind of humoring him. Yeah, it was know? a nice touch. And I mean, I edited the daylight side. There's very little, but when you hear that, yeah. you know, yeah. that's really the darkest tasty. song on the record, actually. She wrote the writ, but I just couldn't sign it. I wanted her heart, but I just couldn't find it Her silver tongue was sharper than her soul Take me out on the threshing floor She went out like a razor blade Cut me down like sugar cane All that rage I dodged a bullet To me, the the recent work, crickets. I'm not sure. It feels it sonically feels like it's part of the set, but certainly, open heart and hornet's nest feels like really two parts of the same album. Like it feels like a double album. It's interesting. That could be a gatefold and and two records that fit together. It could also be that um, that providence in a way sets the table for these records. Providence um, is always going to be, I think, it's, my favorite record that it's I've a, done. It's gorgeous. But, but And then Crickets is also like a prelude. Like To me, when you mention Randy Newman and, the, and his theatrical nature of how he writes and hearing how much of that is going on in these songs as well, it feels like you've done this this recent work so contiguously that it it works almost it almost sounds like you went in and recorded it all at one time and are just releasing them episodically but i've listened to them in an integrated way and it feels like like a, you're in a whether it's one long piece of work or just this is this season that you're in i think well it, it is a it season definitely John. works I, I appreciate you first of all just listening but you know providence to me Providence is the first record I've done since Three Horses. So Three Horses, like I recorded in, I think I recorded in 1995. 
I think it was put out in maybe 96. So Providence, recorded in 2017, is the first record that I've done. Same players in the room for two days and then overdub. And everything I've done since then, that's what I've done. Brian, I mean, Crickets is a different band except for Chris and, and James Hollihan, actually. But um, Providence... Providence is important because, you know, I had eschewed playing piano for and B3 for so, you know, I just became comfortable writing these simple songs on guitar and getting good enough to play them and have a great time. And it's portable. You can, you know, somebody wants you to come play a set. You get your guitar, you show up. You're not having to drag a keyboard or rent a piano. And I had gone up to Newport Jazz Festival. I had a gig in Rhode Island where I'm from. And I had breakfast with John Schofield, a great jazz guitar player, who's on Crescent Park on Providence. But I had I had dinner, uh, breakfast with him, and then I went to the jazz festival. And I'm in Rhode Island. It's the a glorious day. I'm crossing the Pell Bridge, which people commonly call the Newport Bridge, which goes across the entire Narragansett Bay. So I'm at the crest of this bridge i look north at my home state which is all water and green and i'm like man you grew up here and i had shaken the dust off when i came to nashville and the combination of breakfast with schofield crossing that bridge and then going to the jazz festival i knew i had to write a record about growing up in Rhode Island and then coming south and embracing south. So, you know, Rhode Island Yankee on Jefferson Davis Court. <laughs> and um, that is when I fell in love with piano. And a band I had worked with in Norway the year before, that same year, I had they had wanted me to, uh, the Humming People, they're fantastic. I played on, you know, produced their records and I was, they wanted piano on this one thing, and I just did this kind of ragtime romp. I started falling back in love with piano and haven't looked back. I still play guitar with Red Dirt Boys or whatever, and I kind of see even Red Dirt Boys as maybe the placeholder for something I might want to do on guitar. And I mean, right now I'm working on a new batch of tunes and one of them might be a guitar song when I record it, but I just sort of feel, and also I've just dove into Monk. The Crickets, the Crickets record, I went in on a, just thinking maybe I needed some licensing music. Played it for a friend of mine whose ex-husband uh, is Chris Wood from Medesky Martin and Wood and, and the Wood Brothers, uh, who were all friends of mine. Anyway, his his ex-wife heard this stuff, and and I was just saying to her, I, I think I blew it, man. I don't think this is any good. And she was like, no, 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 no. This is a cool record. This is jazz. I didn't want to say I was a jazzer because I'm not educated. And, you know, you, you look at the resume of your average jazz musician. He's probably got his Ph.D. And, <laughs> you know, I'm not that guy. And I didn't want to be seen as a pretender. And then Rasan Barber, who plays sax on that record and on other projects of mine, I told Rasan, I said, I really feel insecure about putting this out. He's like, oh, no, man, you know, no, jazz needs you. You know, we need humor. You got humor. You got soul. We need what you're doing. Not and which is not to say so. Now I'm a jazz musician, John, which is an even smaller pie than Christian. <laughs> I was going to say there's some parallels there, yeah. to talking about a niche. But you know, all that to say that yes, there is a cohesive thing. I I I see, I see um, crickets as kind of a. I don't know if I'll do another one of those, but I do see Providence as the gateway drug to me. And then I see a open, open heart and um, a hornet's nest are those three are really important records to me. You could um, I could almost like not worry about anything else. Ain't getting any younger. I'm in a rented flat. 
My hair's all falling out, my credit's bad Ain't no flashy dresser, ain't got no PhD Ain't got no blue blood, yeah, I got a history Get to the bottom, figure it out, solve this mystery I'm in high con, but I got my doubts And I'm glad for whatever you see in the likes of me do you kind of feel like you're doing everything you want to be doing or is there a, a field left to no, I'd love to, to be see playing for you? more. Well, I mean, do you mean just because of No, I think I'm COVID right where I need or? to be. I'm writing I got so used to co-writing because it is I mean, co-writing is a wonderful enterprise and it's generally as you know, you can have more success that way, you know. But Providence also marked my first record since Three Horseshoes that was not co-written, you know, and so I feel like, gosh, you know, you got, I mean, actually Three Horseshoes and Off Kilter, which were just written by me, both of them coming out of some emotionally heavy places, they're special in that way too, you know, versus a co-written, the minute I co-write a song, you, you know, I mean, I co-wrote Ghost of Johnny Cash with, um, uh, Chuck Cannon. Now that came out of the the first that came out of the first night I had moved out of my home, you know, in 2003 or 4 whenever Eleanor and I really split. That night I went to a party, got a little bit high on some wonderful wine, got home and woke up at about 3 in the morning just dehydrated and having thought I'd been in a rowboat with Johnny Cash. Johnny taking me to the other side and You know, I think I could have finished that song by myself because it came out of such a hard place. But I, man, I just instinctively, you know, called a guy that I'd got a Toby Keith cut with. I just thought, wow, man, I bet Toby would like this. I immediately jumped to Commerce instead of finishing that song. And it's a great song, and Chuck made it great. Uh, Chuck and I did versus I don't know what would have happened. Woke up in a cold sweat from a dream of 3 a.m. Drifting on a sea of shadows The rain was whipping in the wind I saw a man dressed all in black Reach out and take the helm And he charted us a course Into the spirit realm I could taste the salt and feel the blisters on my hands As I'm pulling at the oars, rowing on to glory land Sitting in the stern, singing hymns and talking trash Is my broken guardian angel, the ghost of Johnny Cash But Providence, Providence is like, okay, finally, it's just me and the kids, you know, Mm -hmm. or it's just me and my love. It's the same thing. It's just me and whatever my mind and heart give me and whatever I can play here. So do you have a way that you intentionally budget your time and creative resources or do you just kind of go with the flow? (laughs) Oh, man, I'm... I, you know, the only disciplined thing I do, the only actual thing I do that is scheduled is, and I didn't do it today, is I try to walk. I try to walk. My, my goal is five miles every day. That's the only thing I have scheduled. And then, then I sort of prioritize the relationship I'm in. Okay, when, will, when do our schedules allow for a rendezvous? And then it's like, I mean, especially in COVID time, what else are you doing? So I've been painting a bit, but I haven't painted since the fall. So, I, you know, I do that. I write. I'm working on a Christmas record, actually. I just remembered that. In the next few months, I'll cut this record of love songs. And somehow this stuff manages to pay for itself, usually kickstarting or whatever, you know, uh, and it might pay, you know, the Kickstarter might, I don't know, pay my mortgage for two months, too. I don't know. You know, it's just right. 
But money is never, I'm, that's not the first thing on my mind ever. Right. Relationship, creativity, you're just sitting here talking to you. I mean, that to me is what life is made of, yeah. you know. So. It's a blessing, that's for sure. Well, thanks for taking time to do oh, this. Oh, man. My, I, you know, I've been really, you had mentioned doing this some time ago, and I've really been looking forward to it. So thank you, man. Sure, you know, I love you. You're a great friend, old friend now. You man, know. It's, it has been a minute. But, uh, Hopefully, yeah. there's minutes more. <laughs> thank you. As I climb up on my soapbox just for a minute here, I'm thinking about Psalm 33, in particular verse 3, which challenges musicians to sing a new song of praise and to play skillfully before the Lord. Just hearing Phil play is inspiring to me. The musical vocabulary he has mastered on so many different instruments and in so many different genres is just incredible. So that verse came to mind and I went back to read the rest of Psalm 33. What I found really struck me. We are instructed in this psalm to sing for joy and to play skillfully with excellence, not because we feel good or inspired, but because we know that the word of the Lord holds true and that we can trust everything he does. It goes on to remind us that he loves what is just and good and that the unfailing love of the Lord fills the earth. Wow, this broken, pain-soaked, messed-up world is full of the unfailing love of the Lord. Yeah, I believe it is. I am also reminded of this quote from Ernest Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms. Hemingway says, If people bring so much courage to this world, the world has to kill them, to break them, so of course it kills them. The world breaks everyone, and afterward many are strong at the broken places. But those that will not break, it kills. It kills the very good, and the very gentle, and the very brave impartially. If you are none of these, you can be sure it will kill you too, but there will be no special hurry. And then there is Leonard Cohen's amazing song Anthem with the lyric, Ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering, there is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. This psalm doesn't suggest that we praise the Lord when we feel unbroken or uncracked, but that in singing about the Lord's goodness, even the Lord's hunger for righteousness and justice, and in playing music with excellence, we remind ourselves that righteousness and excellence is possible, inevitable even. I know I've said this before, but let's not forget that God calls himself love. 
that he says his name is love. His identity is love. And here, all the way back in the Psalms, we are reminded that he loves justice and goodness. Now, this might sound a little crazy, but one of the things I have always loved about jazz is the way that it seems able to stray so far from what we might think the root or path is and yet makes its way back. The way jazz chords and scales evolve and resolve are more complex and harder to predict, for me at least, than the chord progressions and melodies of rock or pop music. A jazz artist can really take me for a ride, and I just have to trust that he or she will bring me back in better shape than that in which I was found. There's a beautiful tension in those notes, a dissonance that resonates with how I feel as a person longing for love and challenged by fear and injustice in this world. But Psalm 33 challenges me to sing for joy, not after the tension of this world is resolved, but now, in the midst of it, because I know that it will be. It challenges me to play with excellence and to listen and appreciate those who do the same, not because the world reflects that excellence all the time, but because it does not. In the singing of those songs, my emotions, the feelings in my heart, might line up with what I have chosen to believe in my mind, that the God that is love loves justice and goodness, and that God will not fail to fill the earth with goodness eventually. That tension will resolve. Even if that emotional alignment is fleeting, it can be powerful. Don't miss it. So, if you're a musician, don't just play well enough. Play with excellence. If you're a songwriter, don't just write a song that will get the job done. Write songs that blow your own mind clean open so the light can get in. I don't need the lyrics to be specifically religious for them to speak to me of the good and perfect God who is working for justice and goodness now and later. I just need them to be true. Let's sing those songs of joy down by the riverside and in the clubs and on our live streams and wherever else we are able to because love will win the day. Okay, I'm climbing off my soapbox now. that's going to do it for this episode. Before we go, I want to tell you about a couple of things. As I mentioned in part one, I've got a new book just about done. It's a novel actually that I have been working on for many years. In it, a group of people of different racial and cultural backgrounds and even different generations come together to make music in a guy's garage. It starts very simply, but it grows. People are drawn to this unselfconscious blend of gospel, soul, Americana, rock, and Latin American music. But even more, they're drawn by the deep connection they feel with the others in their community. As I've been saying, it's about people being drawn together by the power of music into the power of community where miraculous things happen. I have just launched an Indiegogo campaign in order to raise the funds that I need to finish this book independently, and I hope to record some new music to go with it as a sort of soundtrack. I'd sure appreciate it if you'd check out the page and support it if you can, and tell your friends about it. If you're finding this episode too late to get in on the pre-release campaign, we'll still be posting updated information on the True Tunes site, and you can find that via the link on the show notes page for this episode or head to truetunes.com slash new JJT novel. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank our sponsors at Vision Trust and invite you to consider helping a child through this fantastic organization. Vision Trust comes alongside vulnerable children by partnering with local heroes around the globe to provide health, education, spiritual guidance, and community development. Through the support of their partners, Vision Trust has been able to help lift thousands of children from the grip of poverty in 11 countries, and they are just getting started. You can find the sponsorship link on the show notes page for this episode or go to visiontrust.org. And if you do sponsor a child, please drop me a line and let me know. And if you're new to the show, welcome. We've got some excellent conversations and a lot of great music in the archives waiting for you to discover. Please take a minute to sign up on our email list at truetunes.com and please help spread the word about the show. Our best marketing is you. We're also doing some giveaways and the only way to be eligible is to be subscribed to our email list. So come on already. And speaking of giveaways, we are working on our biggest one yet right now, actually. We are pulling together a major prize pack. It will include a signed copy of my Jesus Bread and Chocolate book 
and an extremely rare DVD copy of the Cornerstone Festival 20 Years and Counting film that I produced nearly 20 years ago, plus a signed super rare Commando for Christ 7-inch vinyl single, even signed by Brian Baumgartner of The Office, no less, some more Electric Jesus and True Tune swag, like one of the podcast glasses we give to our guests, and some classic vinyl to be announced soon. We're doing this massive giveaway in conjunction with the team at Electric Jesus to celebrate the upcoming launch of their brand new podcast, and with our friends at Girder Records, who keep reissuing great albums from the 80s and 90s on vinyl. And yes, we are doing it to build our email list and to increase our ability to communicate with all you lucky people. More details will be sent out soon, but you have to be subscribed to our email list to be eligible, and you have to actually open the emails to win. So, I'm just saying, this would be a really good time to take care of that stuff. Oh, and I have a new email address for you, so make note of this. You can reach me at jjt at truetunes.com. And if you add that to your contacts, you'll be much more likely to actually get our emails when we send them. I just did a giveaway email and saw that less than a third of the folks on the list seem to have even opened the email. It seems likely these messages might be going to your spam folder. But if you add me to your contacts or even drop me a line and tell me what you think of the show, that will greatly increase the likelihood that you get the emails I send out. So JJT at TrueTunes.com. And don't miss our special Spotify Gallery Stage mixtape curated by our guest of honor, none other than Phil Madeira himself. This mix of songs that Phil has played on, produced, been influenced by, or just plain loves will be our main mix for a while. And then, just like Buddy Miller's special mix last fall, it will live forevermore under the new True Tunes profile on Spotify as its own mix. How cool is that? And yes, of course, you can find the link on the show notes page for this episode. And last but not least, if you'd like to support the show, please check out our Patreon program. Your support of as little as $5 a month helps us do what we do here and unlock some special rewards, including early access to high-fidelity wave files of the show, extra content exclusive to our backers, live Zoom gatherings, and more. Go to patreon.com slash truetunes or find the link on the show notes page to get on board, and thank you very much. For a full list of all the music used on this episode of the podcast, check out the show notes page at truetunes.com. Thank you to Phil Keggy and Rex Paul for their instrumental mix of Full Circle that we use as our theme song. And of course, a big thanks to my brilliant and talented co-producer, engineer, and co-conspirator Bruce A. Brown. I could not do this without you. No, would I want to. Thank you, Bruce. The contents of the podcast are protected by U.S. copyright law and are the intellectual property of Gyroscope Productions, with the exception of songs or clips from previously copywritten materials. Everything on this episode is used by permission or under fair use provisions, and this program is intended for the private use of our listening audience. Gyroscope Productions can be reached at jjt at truetunes.com or P.O. Box 60401, Nashville, Tennessee, 37206. Until next time, this is JJT inviting you to create and listen with excellence. Love well, stay tuned, and stay true. I thank God for my darling Christian mother that pointed me to Jesus. If we had more good Christian mothers that would teach the boys and girls how to play more instead of drinking cocktails and smoking filthy old cigarettes, we would have a better America. Better men and women, and not so much juvenile delinquency.